Michael Cioni's passion for digital cinema has helped shape the landscape of the rapidly changing media ecosystem. Got that? As the CEO of LightIron, he has supervised the digital intermediate and workflows on hundreds of feature films, including Ender's Game, Muppets Most Wanted. I didn't see that one. I should. I have a grandson. Maybe he'd like it. The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, 42, and Flight. You all saw Flight, right? Dragon Tattoo was good. And as the industry leader of onset production, Michael delivers Light Iron's Outpost mobile post systems on more than 100 major motion pictures, that is pictures, sorry, television shows, commercials, and fashion, and web-based projects annually. This is every year. One, one thing you may not know, and that, that Michael uh, has a little bit of a history in the Duke City. Um, who remembers the Duke City shootout? During the Duke City shootout, I don't remember what years it was, Plaster City was a, a company he was with, and uh, they provided some tech support for us in post. I was doing post supervision for the shootout, and I remember calling Michael on the phone many times. So he has a little history here. He's helped us get our industry to where it's at. So um, let's welcome Michael with a big, warm New Mexico welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. Yeah. Thank you. It's good to be back. It's really nice to be back, actually. I think I was here probably six or seven years ago. And uh, yeah, that was about the time that I originally came. So it was, it was actually really, really nice to, to come back. Um, and I, I wanted to talk today about some of where I always like to talk about macro components. I like to talk about the big issues so that we could try to figure out how to predict where we are, maybe where we're going to end up being. I love like analyzing different types of uh, components and trends and stuff because I find that um, a lot of times spending time analyzing things allows you to sort of come up with new ideas. So sort of if I analyze something and I don't know exactly what I'm looking for, I can still spend the time thinking about it and try to uh, basically figure out, well, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? And then after I've added sometimes three or four different components of uh, different articles or different people I've talked to or different um, uh, trends that seem to be happening, all of a sudden, the next day, I'll be tying my shoe and an idea will pop in my head and I'll realize that I can tie all those things together and come to a conclusion. And that's kind of what I like to do. And um, I think it enables uh, people that, that sort of go about professionalism this way to be able to prepare themselves um, and ahead of time, be prepare yourselves for the to changes, but also to be able to invoke change and actually make change yourself because that's usually the best thing you can do. Um, if you take the bus, it can be nice to take the bus because you can just sit there and, and be driven, but if you want to go someplace really specific, you're only going to get so close to that. And if you really want to do that, you need to drive it yourself. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. So. Um, again, a little bit about me. I spend a lot of time in digital cinema. In fact, that's really my passion. Uh, when I moved to Los Angeles, I'm originally from Chicago. Uh, when I moved to Los Angeles, I thought it was going to be an amazing opportunity where digital cinema was totally taking flight. And when I got there in 2001, I realized Nobody was really into it. In fact, I thought I was going to be like, you know, strap in and feel the G's like for digital cinema. But I got there and I realized that it was very taboo. Some people think it's, it's, it's heresy. Some people thought it was, uh, 20 or 30 years it was going to require to get to a, uh, an appropriate professional grade or high fidelity state. And so all of a sudden I realized there was a huge hole in the industry. What I thought was going to be an opportunity to uh, learn from masters of the craft in order to kind of get interested in, in, in um, the new technologies, I learned that there weren't very many masters of the craft in the new technologies. In fact, people kind of ran away from it. And I thought that was really interesting. So that kind of became my passion. And so um, I realized also that I had really nothing to add to the film and tape infrastructure. There was a lot of that going on. I didn't really have anything new. I couldn't think of something new for that. So I said, well, why don't I try these new areas? So I love to spend time building more efficient solutions. And it's just over and over, refining and refining and refining, polishing that down so that it's just literally shining. And that, you know, it's something I, I love because it'll never, ever change. That's one of the great things about digital tools is they're subject to a phrase you've probably heard before, Moore's Law. 
right? And Moore's law suggests uh, that every 18 months or so, technology is going to uh, double in speed or have in price. And when you go through things like that, you realize that no matter how much you polish something in digital in a digital speak, it's going to get shinier and shinier and shinier. However, in analog speak, that's not the case. You realize in analog speak, if you have um, 400 feet of film, you cannot make 400 feet of film any smaller than 400 feet of film, right? That's what it is. If you want to take um, a videotape and it's 60 minutes of videotape, you can't take that videotape and make it more than 60 minutes. That's just what it is. But in a digital acquisition and in a file-based acquisition with hard drives, all of a sudden, no matter what you do, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and more and more and more accessible. And so those are the types of things that sort of drive uh, me. This is one of the most important components. And we're going to get to this in a little bit. But if you're not, um, and it actually is really apropos because Sam actually brought uh, a mobile editing system, which is pretty cool because these types of solutions are part of what's going to be um, about a, another, I'd say, ugh, it's going to be tight. It's going to be about five more years of this type of mobile technology. So if you haven't gotten into it, there's a window for about five years. It's going to be really, really good, and then it's actually going to change again. But we're entering um, a really, really op uh, opportune time for getting into mobile technologies. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But first, what we're going to talk about is our media ecosystem. And we have to sort of analyze where we were to figure out then where we are so we can predict where we're going. And that's a really important thing uh, in order to be able to predict how this works. So can anyone see on the screen here what this is a photo of? What do you actually, there's like a story in this photo. What's happening in this photo? Closing of borders. But what else? There's something else. Verizon, what's significant about Verizon? Right, and it has access to information and books and, um, you know, uh, uh, you could buy uh, books and stuff like that. And it's sort of, I don't know if this was planned, but I was, well, this is at the corner of Sunset and Vine, which are, is a pretty famous intersection. This is actually where my office is. And I was going to lunch, and I saw borders closed, and Verizon had this sort of lightning bolt billboard towering on top of the borders with those big fancy yellow store closing sign. I always wonder, is there like, when you're going to business, is there like a store that sells those yellow store cl closing signs? Like, where does everybody get those? Like, but there, everybody's got them. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, basically what you've got is Verizon standing on top of borders and saying, look, we've got something totally different and this mega empire that Borders created, and there's nothing wrong with Borders, what Borders created and what Borders supplied. I shopped at that particular store many, many times. But here's something new. Here's something better. And this is a picture of that being dominated at one of the most famous intersections in all of America. And I don't know that anybody noticed. Sometimes these things happen so slow you don't even notice. And I literally got to this intersection and I almost fell over. because I was like, this is serious, significant stuff. So how can we sort of map this into what's happening? Well, I'm taking three sections here that are not specifically related to motion pictures. So that's intentional. So we've got our advertising, we've got our music, we've got our home entertainment. So if you look at these statistics here, in 1999, the world seemed very, very different. You realize in 1999, there were almost no, no, oh, virtually nobody was actually tracking how much advertising was done on the internet because the internet was so small, the impact was so minuscule, and people's agendas were so um, disinterested in the internet advertising opportunities that no one really kept track of what's going on. So basically we have something like 0% or 1% of advertising takes place on the internet in 1999. And then we've got, of course, uh, the, the buildings of uh, Tower Records and Sam Goody. When was the last time you were at Tower Records or Sam Goody? Right? Yeah, exactly. And then we've got our blockbusters and we've got um, uh, the Hollywood videos and the, and the different rental markets and stuff like that. And then we look at how fast this media ecosystem changed. Freaking crazy fast here because all of a sudden in 2009 we've got $22 billion. If I came to you today and said there's a market that in 10 years is going to be worth $22 billion and today it's worth zero, wouldn't you listen to my pitch? Wouldn't you think about that? You know, it would be like, well, that sounds like I could have lunch over. Like, that's, I'll give you, I'll give you a lunch if you want to talk about something that's zero today and in 10 years, which is a very finite amount of time, we've got $22 billion. And that's how fast this stuff 
changed, yet how subtly it changed. You realize when mountain ranges, you guys got beautiful mountains here, um, and you realize um, mountains are all, they, they, they sort of have a different shapes. And you know, the ones like we have in California, we have the, the Sierras. And I think I read recently the Sierras are actually going to be taller than um, Mount Everest and the, the, the um, Pakistan and, and Indian mountains there uh, because they're younger and they're growing really, really fast. I think they grow about a meter a year, something like that. And you realize mountains that are really, really sharp are ones that are moving very, very quickly, right? And they're very explosive, and they're very um, obvious. And you see mountains that are very, very sharp. But mountains you have here, they're kind of they're rolling, right? They were slowly formed, and they took more time. And they're actually, they're not sharp. They're not super pointy at the top. They're actually very smooth. So they're very subtle. And what's interesting about something like these digital uh, revolutions is these things are moving very, very fast, but they have the smoothness of something that's taking time. Because it's not something that you're waking up and be like, oh my gosh, the whole world's changed. Like, it doesn't feel like that. It actually feels very innate. It feels very nurtured. It feels very mature. It feels very calculated. And that's really, really interesting because it's actually a hundred different points of sociology are retraining us how to adjust and adapt and think. Today, if you go into a new Tesla um, uh, S series, you, you, you look at the new Tesla and um, the entire dashboard, I don't know if you guys have been in one, it's just a big piece of glass. There's no buttons, it's all glass. And it's just like a, you, would, you would call it like a giant iPad. And the entire car is controlled by a touch screen and that's it. If you were to go into that car, you would instantly say, wow, this is very different. But I'll bet by the time you got out of the car, you'd be like, this makes sense. I can figure this out. I know how to use this. This is very logical. And having like 80 buttons on my, my dashboard is like having 80 buttons on a remote control at home. You realize all you need is one button, you know, or no buttons, right? And that's where this, this whole thing is moving. So people are getting very, very used to these types of changes because they're smooth. Now, what makes this top row of components similar? What is the th common thread between these top three components? Shout it out. Hardware, good. What is another, maybe a synonym for that or something that's also describing it? Analog, yep. Yep, one more. Let's try to hone it in. Physical, there we go. Hardware, physical, analog. Yes, these are all physical assets. This is an asset-based in industry, right? These types of things. If you wanted to print 10,000 copies of Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill, you got to print 10,000 copies of it, right? Then you got to shrink wrap 10,000 copies. Then you got to ship 10,000 copies. And then you got to see how many you can sell because you're either going to break a few, you're going to lose a few, and a few are going to get stolen, right? So you got to figure all that out. So of the 10,000 copies, you only sell about 9,400 or something like that, right? And you factor all that in. Now, what's all common about this row of components? Virtualized, not tangible, asset list. These are objects that don't exist. When you put a picture of a model holding a Pepsi on the Internet, you need to make one copy, and you have infinite amounts. When you put that on the back of of a, a magazine, you need as many copies, of course, of that photo as you want to distribute. So asset list development is massively changing, obviously, and we're seeing that happen. And if we now look into where we're going now, the numbers are getting even more staggering. Like we're going to hit $45 billion of, of, in, of, of ad-based uh, revenue um, through the internet, which is a massive number. I mean, this is, this is you know, growing thousands of percents. And then iTunes, I mean, I remember when I first, uh, uh, sort of analyzed this information in 2010, I thought four plus billion songs off iTunes was just a, amazing. That they could sell and move four billion songs. And that was basically the year Tower Records went out of business. And now it's just getting really, really significant. Like these are real serious numbers. Uh, and of course, um, you know, 30 million uh, subscribers of Netflix. It's amazing to think that people just switch. You guys realize with the Netflix issue, which is very, very fascinating, do you guys realize who's had Netflix for more than, say, six or seven years? Anybody? A couple people. Okay. How did you get your Netflix six or seven years ago? DVD. And how did you get that? Mail. Okay. So think, this is crazy, right? We've got a guy that in 2003, 2003, yeah, three, 2002, 2003, 
uh, Reed Hastings says, we're going to start this company and we're going to compete with Blockbuster. And I have this crazy idea. I am going to use the U.S. mail system as my drivers and my cars and my employees and my trucks. You realize that he took the idea of 60 cents worth of postage and said, I can put 60 cents worth of postage on this stuff and I don't have to have thousands of employees. I don't have to buy hundreds of vehicles. I can just send it. So he had this crazy idea of this, but did he call the, this is 2002, right? Did he call the company DVD mail flicks? Did he call it mailman to your door flicks? What do you call it? Netflix. Did anyone use the internet for watching movies when Netflix was founded? Not one. That's how forward thinking this was. That's how out of the box this was. And that's why guys like Reed Hastings are eating everybody's lunch. Because they're able to see this stuff with enough foreknowledge and realize this is where we're going. So they're able to pass up everybody while everybody else is just kind of watching where, where are these people going? Where are they coming from? And you can't adjust fast enough to do that but consumers quickly adjust but think of how much work it would take to get blockbuster to take on all the netflix uh ideologies it would take for it would never happen they tried but it didn't happen but netflix can do it and you know that even um time warner only has 25 million subscribers in america so time warner cable has less subscribers than netflix actually does and time warner is a is is you know a, a big group that provides a lot of cable. So this is how much it's changing very, very rapidly. So the next process we're going to talk about is um, going into the past, present, and future. So that kind of leads us into this. This is a graph that is very, very significant because the year 2010 is really significant. Now, you didn't know it was significant in 2010. When we were happening, when we were in 2010, we couldn't have known we were in a very significant year. But I'm going to show you why 2010 was so significant, which didn't come clear until a couple years later. What we've got here is a picture of film acquisition and digital video acquisition. So tape-based, high definitions, things like that acquisition. And how these sort of, uh, sort of have a relationship with one another. And if you look closely, you'll see they basically, in terms of digital video, and uh, it basically kind of starts in the early 1990s. That's when digital video starts to make an impact, and it's very, very small at the beginning, and grows and grows and grows and grows. And then in the year 2000, we have the beginning of high definition um, in mass production, uh, even though mass production was pretty small at that time, but it was mass production. And we have that kind of happening, and then as soon as high def starts showing up and the collaboration between televisions and cameras start to fuse together, we have a big surge in that type of market, right? So you guys probably remember that happening, remember seeing or hearing or reading about it. But then in 2010, something very, very interesting happened because these are going to transpose not just because digital cinema is, is starting to move forward with HD tape, but because the file-based industry is born. File-based industry comes about in the year 2000. It's very, very finite, very, very small, very, very complicated, very, 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 very meek, actually. But it slowly grows and grows and grows and grows. And by about 2005, when Panasonic pushed really, really hard with the P2 infrastructure, which actually paved the way for a lot of uh, file-based capture, it started to really catapult off of that. And then a bunch of other cameras signed on. And then in 2010, we have an amazing thing that happened. I believe that in 2010, roughly 30% of the market was shot on film, 30% on videotape, and 30% on files. We had three completely different formats. Remember, files are not necessarily just digital. Video is a digital video format. Files are a completely different format, and film is a completely different format. We had three format wars, and they literally converged in 2010. And if you talk to people or you think back to 2010, if you did 10 jobs in 2010, you probably split uh, what they were shot on between these formats, and this is pretty common. And so it was a really, really remarkable year because it was the last year that film actually had a really significant component of the market, significant chunk, and it's really, really died down, will continue to die down. I predicted back in 2010, simply just by following the, the, the trends, I could kind of see where are we going to end up, what's going to be the next trend, what, what years are going to be uh, showing us what results. And so by 2015, all of digital videotape is pretty much extinct, especially in the, in the high-end markets. Um, this is uh, 
almost totally true right now. So if you're working in that type of world, you, you have not seen a, an HD cam videotape being used for motion picture in quite a couple years, probably. Uh, and then we have the file base just skyrocketing. And we're going to talk about all the new file base cameras and how those impact the market as well. But then you can see by 20... Uh, 15, we're going to see files really take over, but then files are going to start to descend a little bit. What do you think is going to happen? The cloud, very good. There's something uh, very, very, that's very, very good. The cloud is absolutely right. And what's going to happen is we're going to see cloud-based capture start, start, not, not finish, because everybody's thinking, well, how can that be? Well, because it's starting. When things start, they start small and they grow. So this is a starting in 2015, but by 2021, we're going to see a major, major change, another entire change, which is why right now we're in a window of opportunity, which is sort of the junior high slash high school level of file-based work. And then we're going to get into the collegiate level, if you will, in uh, 2020, 2021. That's where this is going to happen. And what's going to come about is we're going to see a lot more in terms of lensing, which is really cool. In fact, these are a picture of Panavision's new 70 millimeter lenses. They just created these. These lenses actually are for 70 millimeter size sensors. So they're for super high resolution sensors where most sensors today are based on super 35 millimeter sensors. So this is basically going to have double the resolution coverage than typical lenses do today. So if you've ever had a very, very high resolution camera, you put a lens on it. Sometimes you get a little vignetting on the side or you get some blurriness or some refractions on the side. You may not want that because the lens isn't designed to cover a sensor that large. Panavision's just built some incredible lenses and that's going to be a part of a trend going forward. Um, another thing that's going to be really big is I believe sensor technology is actually a little easier to develop horizontally than it is vertically. The way uh, these things are built, horizontal resolution is actually easier to work because of the way the um, photo sites actually fire. So horizontal resolution is easier to get than vertical resolution. Uh, you ever heard of like rolling shutter artifacts, right? Rolling shutter is a vertical problem. So as you increase re resolution, you need to move your pictures faster to avoid rolling shutter. But if you want to increase resolution this way, rolling shutter doesn't have a problem this direction. It has a direct problem this direction, not lengthwise. So we're going to see uh, a wider trend for sensors. I think they're going to go a bit wider. I, there's a lot of lens manufacturers that are pushing wider lenses. So we're going to see some widening uh, trends coming up. Um, and so that kind of begs the question here, when you want to improve your creative control, and we've got these little predictions we're starting to make on what's going to be happening out there, how can we really improve creative control? And I really believe it's dramatically, it's mostly focused on speed. Speed is a huge component to improving creative control. Feedback is part of that because it's all about feedback and then communication. But speed is part of it, which is why you're going to see the benefits of smaller, faster, lightweight, and mobilized technologies because all those things benefit creative control. You realize, you guys probably know this better than anybody, um, Los Angeles is having a problem with keeping people shooting in the state of California. So people are shooting all over the place. And of, I, I probably have, I don't know, 20 shows going right now. I would say 15 of them are not in California. And that's become pretty normal. Because of that, creative control actually gets more important, not less important, because as people travel around the world and they end up shooting stuff, they need to be able to see and talk to each other. So this is a really, really important uh, component. So I really cannot stress enough the investment in the ideology, the training, and even the physical infrastructure of mobile technologies. Mobile technologies has another, again, about five years of really solid development that's going to be very, very important and very, very significant. So I tremendously um, uh, encourage you to really look at mobilized technology. And there's all sorts of companies that build mobilized stuff, and then people kind of augment it to make it their own. So I really, really recommend that. But where it's going to go as we get into 2021, when this mobile technology starts to crest and we start to see that development on that graph I was showing you earlier, well, it's going to start getting into mobilizing something 
that is not even physical in structure that you can take it with you, it actually is always with you. You know, you realize YouTube is always with you, right? Whether you want it or not. YouTube is always with you. And so cloud color is really where it's going to be going for because cameras are going to automatically start to manipulate and move their color into the cloud. And that color is actually going to be non-destructive, sort of like um, a layer. It's going to be a layer on top of your footage. So you can actually change it. It's not baked in. It's not uh, you know permanent. It's actually just moving around. And so when you have that, you can manipulate those pictures after you shoot them. And you can manipulate them anywhere. Imagine logging into YouTube, uh, you know, anecdotally, and YouTube being your color correction room. Because it's where you go. Because the footage, you don't have to go. Right now, you go to facilities and you go to brick and mortar places because that's where the footage lives. Or you have to be on set and you have to do it right there on set because once it leaves the set, you're not going to be able to touch it. Not true with cloud because the cloud goes wherever you go. So you'll be able to start manipulating your pictures, not just in terms of color, but in terms of choices and feedback and editing and um, and selects and review and all those types of things, but even on a creative level like color and being able to do all that stuff on the cloud. And then that color is, again, not baked in. This color will then be a layer that NLEs will actually talk to. In other words, as you are in Albuquerque and you're looking at your footage and you're adjusting the way you want it to behave, it is automatically adjusting the same thing in the editor's office, wherever the editor is, because they're referencing the same database of color information. They're not referencing the same footage. Don't get that wrong. This is a layer. It's like a, it's like a hoodie. It's not all your clothes. It's just a layer. And so it's very small. It's, it's a very small component to the entire outfit. So this is actually very lightweight data because it's just controls. It's just commands. It's just some, it's like, it's like this. Here's a perfect example. If you guys know, like, people have, like, Xbox One and they have PlayStation, right? And they play against each other. How on earth, and this is what's so funny because a lot of Really, really smart people always say, Michael, your arguments are great, but they don't make any sense because we don't have the bandwidth for this stuff. And I go, has anybody seen a video game lately? Video games do not transmit pictures through the Internet. They transmit commands, right? And so you have millions of people that are playing uh, 60 frames per second, three-dimensional, very, very high-quality instant uh, graphics being rendered, but they're not push. They're not just stealing all the bandwidth for America, right? Everyone's like, "Well, all the gamers have all our bandwidth." No way. They're pushing just little tiny bits of metadata because the gaming console is doing the heavy lifting. Same application here. Your footage will live locally for quite a bit longer, but the commands for manipulating it and changing it are remote, and so you're just seeing the result of your changes, just like playing Xbox. Does that make sense? And that's what, that's what Hollywood's going to adopt once Hollywood figures it out. <clears throat> okay, so this is kind of interesting because the next component of cinematography and, and, and cameras is an analogy that I, I, I think uh, makes sense. So just to be super clear, this, isn't a mo this money analogy isn't about the price of cameras. It's sort of showing you a, a, a different... I'm using money to describe uh, a, a distance, not actually the price. So... In the past, you would guys would say, if you looked at this right now, you'd say the, the difference between a, a dollar and a $10,000 bill is a big difference. And so you would treat them very, very differently. And you would expect to have much more value of a $10,000 bill versus a dollar bill. I think that all makes perfect sense. See, what happened is at the beginning of digital cinema, cameras were so different that there were cameras that could be separated similar anecdotally between a $10,000 bill and a $1 bill. Again, I'm not saying an XL1 was a dollar. I'm just saying the difference between X01 and something like one of the best high fidelity early digital cameras was called the Dalsa camera. They made two. There was one called the Origin. This is a picture of the Evolution, which actually was never really put into production. And this was like early on super hi-fi 4K digital cinema. And the difference between the pictures you got with the Dalsa and the difference between the pictures you got from the Canon were very dramatic. They didn't look anything alike. And anyone, it doesn't matter who you are or what your, your state of mind is, you would be able to pick the two out because you go, oh, that's a lot better than that one. Okay? So the difference in measuring cameras in the past, especially digital, was very dramatic. A dollar, ten thousand dollars. 
But today's cameras, I say the difference can be measured in dimes. We basically now have cameras that are operating so similarly that the difference between camera A, B, C, D, E, F, G is basically maybe a dollar and a dime. They're actually very, very similar. And there's a lot of people out there that are very, very passionate. Uh, I always say, I, I, we say the joke now, don't be camera racist. Don't be camera racist. Because there's people that are very, very passionate about uh, cameras. But, 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 but I've learned uh, at the time, at the beginning, camera racism made more sense. Because when you have uh, one camera and two cameras that are so dramatically different, people take sides on really, really big issues. If we learn that, we've learned that as a, as a society. But as issues get more and more similar, people don't need to take sides anymore. They don't need to take, it doesn't have to take such a huge stance because the market doesn't have to be so, uh, you know, separate. So if you really examine camera technology and camera photography right now, you'll realize that the cameras are actually more and more similar. So there are actually very, very subtle differences between them, which is a really big deal. The big players going forward that I'm a big fan of are the ones that are pushing 4K today. So there are, these are not all the cameras in the world. I totally get that. There are many, many cameras that I didn't put on this list. But as far as cameras that I consider high fidelity, that would actually stand the test of time, that would put your content in the right place right now, these are the best cameras that are just either come out already or are coming out in the next few months. Um, and these are, these are all really, really good examples of camera companies getting more and more similar and less dissimilar. And that's really important because if you think about where we're going in tomorrow's camera, the trend is going to be pennies. It's going to be more and more and more and more similar. In fact, this list of cameras back here is almost all 4K ProRes machines. The idea of shooting ProRes as a capture codec was sort of an accidental stumbling that Aeroflex made when they put it in as like a proxy option, and then everybody went crazy for it because they loved the idea of the simplicity, the understandability, the safetyness, the fact, even um, the, the familiarity of the codec. Like people got really excited about ProRes, and 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 a lot of people, including myself, were like. That's so strange. I would never want to f photograph my footage on a format that Apple is in charge of. That just seems very, very risky because I don't know if they have an interest in making sure that we can open this file in 10 or 20 years. Try opening uh, you know, a QuickTime movie from 1997. It's not as easy as you think, you know, because they don't necessarily, Apple doesn't say, oh, I'm really worried about this 97 thing. We got to get this stuff. They don't care. It's not their job to care. They don't really worry about that. So I was worried that ProRes would be a problem, but Apple's actually showing that they're like, whoa, everybody's using our Kodak now. Okay, well, I guess we won the Kodak of the Year award, but now we got to make sure that we support it. So it's actually kind of probably work out fine in the end, but it was definitely something I thought was strange. And I realized, though, that familiarity is safe, and so people wanted to use ProRes. So these are basically now becoming like, it's becoming a fleet of like 4K ProRes cameras. But in the future, cameras are going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually what we're going to end up having is basically a sensor. It's probably going to be a lens mount, and you just put a sensor in the back of a lens. That's basically what's going to end up happening. Because the, the microprocessors are just going to get very, very small. And all the camera differences are going to be so similar that what makes the camera different is going to be the lens. It's going to be filtration. It's going to be lighting. It's going to go back, honestly, to what it used to be. Isn't that strange? Because, you see, film used to basically be used by everybody in a very similar way. And what changed was digital cameras all look completely different. And so we went through about 15 years of trying to make digital cameras look like Kodak 5219 stock. Well, ultimately, that's where we're going back. We're going to have sensors that all basically have similar technology, similar textures, and we're going to use the creative elements of analog properties like filtration and glass, to make better pictures. So it's going to be kind of interesting to do that. Um, and it'll be something to kind of see happen over the next six, seven years. So this is where camera, the camera race is right now. Resolution is the number one thing that cameras are kind of founding their properties on. Kodak is another one. Price is another one. But resolution is really kind of the flagship of where we're going. So sometimes people then ask, well, who's resolution really important to? You know. Cinematographers could argue resolution is important to them. Uh, you could argue that 
uh, there's directors, and they, they, would, they would say that it's, it's, it's important to them. Studios would say it's important to them. Maybe engineers, maybe editors. A lot of people could argue 4K resolution is important to me, and there's value to it. But I really think there's someone else who doesn't say much, who doesn't get a lot of cred a lot of times, that actually 4K resolution uh, is most important to. And these people don't always get the actual uh, recognition that they need to, and that's the consumer. The consumer actually, and I believe this will prove out in the future, it's hard to prove this out now, but I believe in the future it'll be true. Uh, the, the consumer actually is who's really, really interested in 4K resolution, but they just don't even know it yet. The consumer, well, a lot of consumers don't. A lot of consumers are not aware that they care about quality. They haven't realized that, or they don't know exactly what they're asking for, but they're starting to continue to wise up to it. And so we then want to say, well, what resolutions are consumers actually getting? Where, where are they getting high resolutions? Because pretty much everything's 1080p. Yeah. So this is really interesting, given what you just said, because you're talking about moving to Netflix Right. So it's a great comment about the importance of this stuff and the fact that it's all converging, but um, I'm going to actually address about everything you just said. So uh, we're, we're right on track. Um, but really what, what the, the critical component to what your comment is, is you have to remember that the people are accepting, they're, they're trying to improve the experience. Everybody's got to improve the experience. The consumer wants a better experience, and the content creators want to create a better experience. And so we have to find outlets that enable that to be possible. Um, and so how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do it with kind of the next session, um, what I call the high-fidelity horse race. And this is going to start to make a lot of sense. So we've got this little horse race here. Um, and if you were to talk about what you consider the highest quality pictures that are available today, you would say cinema delivers the highest quality pictures. This is the group that is putting the biggest pictures on the screen. They have the most expensive image machine, a, a, a 4K or 2K projection system, these very, very high-end uh, DLP projection systems. And this is basically where the best quality lives. Then second behind that is like television. Television's got some really good pictures. They make a really good picture in, in their kind of their, their market and they broadcast it all relatively high quality. And then there's this sad group at the end, this web, this internet group. And the internet group is always like, well, they have content and they have something, but you know, bandwidth being an issue and accessibility and understanding, familiarity, all those types of things. And so if you look at the actual qualitative technical specs of this stuff, you can see that we've got 2K resolution as a standard and the absolute uh, leading way to deliver pictures in the cinema. cinema. We've got HD or 1080i in the uh, uh, broadcast world, and that's where that stuff lives. And then we've got the internet, which hovers around 720p. That would be a good day. Um, in terms of how that works. So you guys more or less agree this is sort of a picture of kind of how we exhibit things, okay? So here's what's going to happen. This is why this is gonna get very, very, very exciting. What's gonna happen is you're gonna see the transposition of the internet and cinema. In terms of quality, the cinema and the internet have very, very conflicting developmental roadmaps, and that is the internet is something that everybody pour, pours into and utilizes, and cinema is not. The internet is something that can be averaged amongst a huge amount of people, and cinema movie theaters cannot. And the technology that's developed into making the internet uh, a more efficient tool is happening at a dramatically faster rate than in cinema. Cinema developments in terms of exhibition with projection systems moves at a far slower rate than the development of internet solutions and internet quality results. And so this is why we're gonna have that. And I believe television is gonna stay somewhere in the middle. They've got their own problems, uh, but they're gonna stay somewhere in the middle. And so we're gonna have this total flopping now. Now, it shouldn't be this way. I, I don't, I'm not saying that this is correct, it's right or wrong. 
uh, it basically is just happening based on people's interests. Because if you get complacent in any type of technological development, then someone else is going to pass you by. If you don't be cannibalistic in sort of your uh, development strategies, then someone might take your lunch for you. So this is kind of where it's going to happen. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, this is where part of the fuel comes to be the case. I wrote an article in ICG magazine last April called uh, The Broadband Travel Guide. And it's written actually to cinematographers. And it sort of says, if you're going on a trip and the trip is broadband, what do you got to pack with you? And that was sort of the idea of the article. And a couple of the statistics that came out in there, one was 30% of millennials are watching all their content online. So 30% of millennials are 100% rel relying on the internet for information and entertainment. So that's a really significant number. But really more significant is 78% of adults watch something, use it at some component. So almost everybody uses the internet for information and research pretty much for some component of it. Uh, and about half of American adults actually have some sort of e-reader or tablet. So that is a technology. Now these statistics five years ago were radically different. And that's part of where this matters. So you can't just look at things based on today. Remember the graph I showed from 2010, 1990, and stuff like that? You have to look at trends because trends, if you have Evo Knievel going up a ramp at 80 miles an hour, when he leaves the ramp, your brain can assume what's the next few seconds going to look like. That's exactly what this stuff is telling us. These are maps, these articles, these people that keep track of this stuff, they start giving us plot points. And we plot that stuff down, we can start to see what is the picture going to look like. And you have to look at the maps that point down as well. If Evil Knievel drives down a ramp, you can know what that's going to look like. So um, this is another component, a few more statistics that just came out actually uh, very, very recently. Um, and uh, cable cutting being on the rise is very significant. In fact, the fact that Time Warner actually has less subscribers than Netflix is a huge component to this. That's, a, that's actually a really, really interesting uh, element to this sort of story that's being told. So the internet is going to be the high fidelity winner. If you want to do 4K and you want to push high fidelity and you wait for the movies to deliver it, you will wait longer than if you wait for the internet to deliver it. I promise. So. The how, how is the 4K web going to work? Like, well, then what does a 4K internet look like? How is that actually going to happen? Well, this is really important because there's a couple components that need to go into this, but I think all these components suggest there's great opportunity. So the first one is HEVC. HEVC is basically H.264. You guys know H.264. We use that for the internet pretty regularly. It's the new friend of H.264 also called H.265. This is a spec that runs, I'd say, it's kind of fungible, but I'd say 60% more efficient than H.265. So there's two things at play here. One, if you take H.264, let's say you have a file at 3 megabits. That's a very, very conservative way to stream video. You wouldn't have buffering problems if you did a 720 3 megabit stream. Uh, if you did H.265, the same quality of picture Actually, an improved quality a little bit, but you could have basically the same quality picture can stream at 1.5 megabits. So it's much more efficient. So you can cut all your data rates 50, 60, 70 percent and get the same picture, or you can maintain the data rate and the picture gets twice as good. So that's where these start to play. But I said there was two things at play. The other thing is this. The more pixels you have, the better arithmetic can be in terms of averaging. If you have fewer pixels, it's actually harder to make a picture than if you have more pixels. It's kind of this weird bell curve where there's a point where if you have very few pixels, there's not a lot of picture. And then if you have a whole bunch of pixels, you end up being able to average more over the course of a picture. So as H.265 is given more pixels, it actually can be more efficient in 3K or 4K than it can be in HD or standard def. Standard def is very inefficient because there's not a lot of samples to choose from. Does that make sense? Because it's not very fine. There's not a lot of detail. But the internet, if you've ever noticed, is very good at averaging. It loves to, the, these codecs that are built for the web are very good at averaging. And so the more pixels you give them, the more, uh, the better the average gets. So high resolution is, is possible with this. The other thing is we've got retina displays and LED displays. Retina display technology is actually greater than 10-bit color. So if you have an iPad 4 or an iPad um, Air, 
These panels actually are 10-bit color panels. They're actually 2K resolution and 10-bit color panels. So this is a much, much higher quality picture. Uh, my phone is a retina display. So these are higher quality pictures. So you don't even have the limitations in the color. You actually have a much more professional grade, high fidelity color. Um, and then we get to GPU decoding. And I don't want to get too technical on you guys, but basically what GPU decoding means is the more advanced of a, okay, you guys know on your phone, if you open the calculator, you get the calculator, right? What happens when you turn your phone this way? You get the scientific calculator. Isn't that a great name for a calculator? The scientific calculator. You basically get the complex calculator. I, I don't even know how to use. So the idea is if you have more and more, uh, better and better calculators, you can do more complex math. Right? Because if you only have the, 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 the calculator pointed in portrait orientation, there's only so much math you can do. Maybe you have square root and that's about all you get, right? But if you go to the scientific calculator, you end up having the ability to do way more complex algorithms. You follow me? Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, GPU technology is enabling much more advanced calculation potential. There's, there's scientific calculators there. And so we can give it more complex arithmetic. So we can take things like more advanced compression and we can result by having better pictures because the computers can do more complex math. That's the key. So the point is, if you're frustrated or concerned about the internet having not enough bandwidth to push the footage through, you're thinking the wrong thought. It's not about bandwidth. It's about how efficient can you pack that stuff in? Can you tighten it down, right? It's sort of like those commercials you see. I mean, we, we, we all see them. We, it's like they're all, you, like you can't turn it off. When you see the commercial where they put the clothes in the bag and they put the vacuum on it, it sucks all the air out. It's fascinating, right? It's like so satisfying to watch happen. It's like the same thing. You can have the same amount. Admit it. You know it. You love watching it. You're like, I'll watch this. So the idea is if you have the same amount of space and you can do something to it to cram more clothes into that space, you need to have something more advanced. The vacuum is the scientific calculator in that analogy. GPUs and computers are the analogy. That's, that's the thing. That's the vacuum. It's going to create a more efficient packing so that we don't need a bigger pipe to put this in. We can actually push more through it through more efficient means. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's where we're headed. Um, I think that's really good for enthusiasts that are behind this stuff because it creates opportunities because it's like, well, here's a new market. If I told you today that the internet was going to get even bigger, it's not too late. You know, it's going to get even bigger and it's going to change everything. So in terms of the road to broadband, uh, what can people do to kind of prepare uh, for this? Because I said there's opportunities. There might be ways to capitalize on this. Well, there's three things that I kind of point out here that I think are really good. The first thing, and I think Sam will actually be able to sh demonstrate this really, really well, because Sam's actually really good at, 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 at uh, uh, explaining this part of the process. Um, native editing. Native editing is something that we're going to have to start getting more and more acclimated to, because native editing is not transcoding. It's taking original media and working directly with it. That's going to be a big component to um, where we're going to go with the road to 4K broadband, is we cannot have this... You remember how in the past we did this offline online? It's past. We do it today, right? We do a low res and then we go back to high res, right? Well, we did that. We've been doing it that way for forever, basically. Even when we made film work prints, we made kind of a lower quality work print and then we went back to the high fidelity negative. If you could non destructively work with negative film, wouldn't you? Of course you would. If you, if you could do it without being fear of damaging it, you would. If you could work in full res the whole time, wouldn't you? Of course you would. So what are the things holding us back? Well, that's some of the stuff Sam's going to talk about and demonstrate how we can beat that. But the two leaders in NLEs that are actually thinking that makes sense are Adobe Premiere and Final Cut 10. These are the groups saying we actually have a roadmap for native editorial the whole time. I think that 4K monitoring is a big deal. And there's two ways to 4K monitors. You need A, a display device, and B, a way to push images to that display device. 
And those are like almost equally complicated. In fact, if you've ever tried to monitor in 4K, you realize that getting the monitor is actually the easy part. Like if you were ever to rent a 4K projector or a 4K TV or something, like, well, that's actually not that hard. How the heck do I plug something into this thing? Just four years ago when I did, um, uh, four or five years ago when I did the social network, um, the projector we were using was a Sony 4K projector. It took eight SDI inputs. Eight, because that's where the technology was at one and a half gigahertz uh, 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 SDI. To so order to get a 4K picture into that projector, it literally has, a, it's called Ocklink SDI. It had eight barrels just to get one picture of an RGB 4K picture up there. Today, a Mac Pro has its standard on one $25 cable, right? That's so fast and so smooth, it's those smooth rolling mountains, it's moved so quickly that we don't even realize that we went from eight cables to just one $30 cable to produce the same thing. That's, this, that's, that's a huge component of this. So then we've also got to figure out uh, something called extractions. And I'm really, really excited about extractions, and I'm going to kind of show you kind of briefly what that is. So um, in terms of 4K monitoring, I talked about the Mac Pro, but there's also, I just wanted to give you a little bit of exposure uh, to three different monitors that I really like. Th these are three monitors. These are not the only 4K monitors in the world. These are just three that I've had experience with and I like. Um, I think that the uh, 3010 from Canon is actually the best 4K panel out there. These are professional reference panels. These are not televisions. Let's make that clear. These are professional reference television, uh, monitors. And the, the, the Canon is just fantastic. Uh, when you see it, if you see it, it's just really got the best texture, wonderful contrast, really, really beautiful images. Um, and so that's a great display. Panasonic has a BTLH model. They've been making the BTLH line for quite a long time. And I like the BTLH line because they're very robust. They're not that fragile. Uh, the Canon's a lot more fragile product. The BTLH, you see those on set all the time. Um, and so this is a, a, a 31 inch uh, 4K BTLH, which is great. And then you've got HP making the Dream Color. The Dream Color is really cool. It's not actually a 4K panel, but it takes 4K signals and it displays like 2.5K. So you can give it a full 4K signal, it will scale it down. You can either look at it at one to one or you can have it scaled down. And it's a great hybrid approach to being able to work with 4K because it's way better than HD. It's like two times better than HD. So pricing, some of these are, are pretty pricey and they're, they're hard to kind of uh, get a hold of, but it gives you a sense, uh, like the Dream Color is a great starting point when it comes to uh, getting into 4K monitoring. But all these can virtually, uh, out of the box, be hooked up to a Mac Pro. And you can be working with 4K files, you can be editing with them, and you can be monitoring them. And you probably have less cables than you have today with your high definition stuff. That's what's really cool about where we're headed here in, in the mech cylinder and things like that. So it's pretty cool to have um, something like that. Now, this is a question that I think is fair. With so many pixels, are pixels even enough? And this is something that's actually, uh, uh, this is a big, it's becoming a big issue in Hollywood. I'm starting to hear people argue this, um, and, it, and part of it really bothers me because I think people are making a really foolish argument. They don't even understand what they're saying. Uh, but the, the question is fair because people will say, I am interested in the best pixels, not more pixels. That's what they say. Now, there's some major flaws even with that statement in itself, and I, I won't go into it. But, but I understand what they're trying to say. I want a better pixel. I don't just want more pixels. But see, the unfairness is, more pixels is a component of better pixels. You see, if I were to be totally you know, joking, if I could tell you I could make the best pixel in the world, it's just I could make one giant amazing pixel. It'd be the, it'd be the best pixel ever. One. And that's why these people that are making this argument are kind of acting a little foolish because they're, 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 these are people who are not in favor of a 4K future, which there's a lot of people that have vested interests not in 4K development technology. And so they go, I want a better pixel, not more pixels. And, and the truth is you can't have one without the other. You know, you need to have more pixels in order for them to appear better, or else I have one just giant, giant six million bit black square. And I go, that's a six million bit pixel on the screen. 
it's the best looking pixel of ever, of ever, you know? And it's like, well, that doesn't make a difference, right? I can't see a picture yet. So you need, a, you need more than one pixel to make a picture. So 4K is one big issue in the number of pixels. But I agree with them. It is not the only issue. And people that get behind 4K pictures are making a little bit of a mistake because they're forgetting there's other issues. And there's two more issues that are coming up that you guys are all going to get familiar with in the next few years. HDR, which is high dynamic range, and Rec 2020. And I'll, and I'll demonstrate those in just a second. But these are going to be issues. Um, but first, I want to go back to the 4K camera. So, Well, I'm going to start with 4K. So we said we have, um, we have a, a 4K here. So this is what an extraction is. This is a framing chart from a, a red Epic camera. So it shoots 4K or 5K pictures. And this is what it looks like in a 2 to 1 aspect ratio. So there's your resolution, 5120. And so you've got your picture right there. An extraction photography technique wasn't really possible when we shot HD video because HD video does not have enough resolution to justify an extraction. But these new cameras do. So what you have here is actually a frame within a frame. It's actually more similar to how we used to shoot with film because we often would crop or extract from film. But with digital cameras, we stopped doing that. What you see is what you get, right? Well, that might not be the best choice. So you have a center extraction frame inside of these pictures. And with that, you end up being able to reposition, zoom in, stabilize, reframe. And that allows you to actually improve the precision of your product. Uh, people now are commonly stabilizing all the shots and they're actually controlling camera movement with much more precision because when the camera operator is on the dolly and, a, and an actor moves, sometimes the camera operator moves and then the actor moves back and the camera operator moves, moves back and all of a sudden you have movement in a picture that is very subliminal to audiences but it's there and movement is taking energy away from the picture. Unintended movement takes energy away from the picture. And so there's always exceptions. I know some of you have a picture like, well, that's not always true. You're right. It's not always true. But generally, when you're trying to focus in on things and you elect to be on a dolly that is smooth and that dolly has a little bump in it, you can get rid of it now. And you can get rid of it without blowing it up. When a image, need, when a boom mic dips into the frame, you can refix that without uh, you know, blowing up. And you can do all that. In fact, if you use the Dragon camera, I'm working on a film right now. The first Dragon film will come out in October. And on this film, it's actually shot 6K, framed for, whoops, sorry. It's shot 6K, uh, framed for 5K, and then scaled down to 4K. So it's a 654 approach. And it is the most pristine, uh, precise film uh, audiences will probably ever see because there is so much reframing and stabilization and reconstruction. In fact, some filmmakers are taking takes from different actors' performance takes and they're stitching them together and they have so much leftover resolution, they can stitch two actors together from two different takes into one take, making a better take that wasn't actually ever photographed and you can make that happen because you don't have to blow things up. Does that make sense? Because it's all about crafting better precision. And if actor one does a great take on take one, and actor two does it on take two, now you got to pick, well, which one do I like better? Don't settle. If you pick them both, you cut them out, and you put them together, and then you can stabilize. So it's a really, really great technique to improve your products. You can't do this with 1080p, right? You just don't have it. But when you go up to these 4, 5, 6K resolutions, you have it. OK, so I mentioned earlier pixel size versus pixel quality, right? That's kind of where we were. So we're talking about this. So I want you to yell out, some things are fads and some things are flops. So digital capture, fad or flop? Like, is it a fad or flop, or is it going to stay? Digital capture is probably going to stay, right? right? Some things are going to stay. Uh, DVD, that wasn't really a fad or a flop, right? DVD stuck around, right? We kept that, right? Uh, laser disc. Yeah, it was kind of a fad. It kind of flopped, right? Like, that, that didn't really stick on, right? So some things didn't. 3D, what do you guys think? Fad? Maybe, probably, yeah, could be. So that could be something um, that goes away. 4D, which is the, the seats that move, like, a, like, and they blow, like, water. They put water in your face when they're, yeah. Yeah, we'll see, right? That's starting to happen. The first, there's two 40 theaters right now that are, are one in L.A. and one in New York. Um, THX. That kind of stuck around, right? Like, people saw value in that, and that sort of caught on. Um, 4K cameras. 
Some people think those are fads and flops. Some people think 4K cameras are going to go away, that, that a, better, a better pixel is better than more pixels. Uh, I think they'd be wrong. UHD TV. Some people say, well, we just all bought HD TVs, and now we're supposed to buy another one. Well, there's, there's, some, there's some reasons why that might work. So, um, and then there's this new thing, I don't know if you've heard of, called Dolby Vision. And Dolby Vision, you know the good people at Dolby, in their world, they mostly are dealing in the world that we're familiar with, with sound. But what if Dolby was to get involved with pictures? So, number of quality, number of pixels versus quality pixels, big issue here. So if we're looking at the number of quality versus, uh, the number of pixels versus quality of pixels, we got 4K, and I mentioned that we got our extraction, that stuff makes a lot of sense, and hopefully you can see the benefits of that. HDR and Rec 2020. So we're going to look at HDR first. I, if you were to Wikipedia HDR or high dynamic range, there's these three photos, and so I pulled these off Wikipedia because these are actually really great examples of how HDR works. This is a very, very simple example. When you have HDR photography and you're shooting in a situation like this, this is basically your standard exposure to expose this St. Louis uh, building, um, like kind of city hall here. And so you're going to expose for the foreground. But if you were to expose for the background, you can see the building, and it's kind of hard to see on that screen, but there's clouds here, and there's a lot more detail in the buildings and things like that. But you lose the actual main building, right, because it's going to overexpose. And so where we're going with HDR is to be able to simultaneously photograph both. This is going to create a much more immersive experience. I would say it's 3D without the glasses, because it starts giving you depth to a picture, that really isn't normally photographable. Now, there's two ways to do this. One, there are cameras that are starting to learn to capture in high dynamic range. So that's one place. You can either have camera sensors that are more sensitive, or they can actually do two exposures at the same time. So that's one way to do it. Or two, the display device will take a picture, and it will stretch it out. So you get as much exposure as you can with the camera, and your display device, a la Dolby Vision, is able to stretch your picture out so that the difference between black and white isn't, um, you know, it's measured you know, 600 times greater than it is today. So uh, that's kind of where uh, dynamic range is going to play. So to me, this is a better pixel, right? This is, gonna, this is an example of a better pixel. But if I add 4K into... HDR, now I have a really, really compelling argument, right? But then we've got this other thing called Rec 2020. And again, I'll keep this very, very simple. What you guys are doing today, what all of us basically do today, this, this, this triangle of colors is basically visible light. That's what we can see. Uh, and when we see inside of that, there's a triangle, there's a black line triangle, and that triangle is the pictures and colors that can display on an HD television. And that is called Rec. 709, and that's actually the spectrum of uh, colors that show up on your television. And that's how we sort of make sure everything looks correct whenever we look at pictures. What Rec. 2020 is going to do is expand that gamut, that area of color potential, almost to the edges of the visible light spectrum. And so people are going to be able to build monitors that can display these colors so far outside of HD color space that we actually have a much more immersive experience in terms of color. So imagine if we add together 4K plus HDR plus Rec. 2020. These are all going to make the components superior. So people that say I want a better pixel, not just more pixels, they're right to say that, but it's important to understand it's connected to more pixels. Because I use an, an, an analogy, when seatbelts started coming out about 40 years ago, uh, that was a good idea, right? But then when they discovered the idea of how to make crumple zones, they didn't remove seatbelts, they added crumple zones to it. And then when they figured out airbags, they didn't remove crumple zones, they said, let's add airbags, and then side airbags. And now cars have sensors on them, and they can break themselves, right? So every time we make an improvement, we don't have to remove the previous version. And I think people have gotten that idea wrongly in terms of image quality. And they're like, well, HDR is better than 4K, so we're just going to go with that. We'll add them together, bonehead. Like, that's going to look even more important, right? More incredible. So that's where I think this is going. These are the three components. But there's one more component 
that is key to making all this successful with people. And this is where a huge opportunity I also think really exists, and that's software. We have to be able to add in the software component to this so that we can build an infrastructure that supports all this. And there is a huge opportunity. There are now companies out there that have realized consumers have some of the best ideas for making applications and tools, and they literally pull people and try to get them to build their tools for them because people come across all sorts of things that inventors might not even think of. Well, when you add 4K HDR, a wider color space, there are so many opportunities attached to those things because if I could tell you that if I came back here in six or seven years and we were watching a hundred billion dollar internet world, if we were downloading, um, you know, $50 $50 billion worth of songs off of iTunes, and there was UHD TVs and cloud color and all things. Uh, now is the time to sort of figure out how to get into that because it hasn't all happened yet. These are trying, this is where the predictability becomes very, very valuable. So software reliance becomes really, really important and very, very exciting. And I think it's one of the, the greatest things uh, that we have. So here's a software development tip, because what you have to do in order to develop software, you don't have to be a coder. Coders, you can actually uh, get, and, and, and one great way to get coders is actually Elancers. If you haven't tried Elancers, these are people that are, you know, 30, 40, 50 bucks an hour that will code in, in anywhere in the world. They're just freelance coders, and so it's a great way to kind of connect with them, and that's a, a way to do it. But the idea is to learn a craft, to get good at a craft. If you just try to say, I'm going to invent something today, pe- some people are like that, and I'm not you know, making fun of them. I just know some people say, I'm going to invent something today. They have no idea what they desire to invent, but most successful inventions come through people that are doing the, the something they invent. They are uh, familiar with the territory and they realize that there's an opportunity, a hole, a frustration that they're uh, you know, associated with. And that is usually where a lot of good investors, not always, but that's where these come from. So I always say, learn the craft. Learn the craft of what we're doing here. Identify what gaps exist. And then you use software to solve those gaps and plug those holes. At my company, Light Iron, we probably have built I don't know, maybe 30 applications, maybe more. I don't even know. We probably have 30 or 40 apps that just plug holes. They're all designed to solve problems because we know our craft and then we recognize or identify gaps in the process. I don't sell most of those tools. I only sell a couple of them. But most of them we just use to solve problems, and it makes things more efficient. And I'm sure there's some sort of market for selling them, and maybe someday we will. But in the time being, we just solve them. And then we move forward, and we're able to work w- w- more efficiently. So, you, but you got to know your craft first, I think, especially in in uh, entertainment business, because the the way in which you're trying to move content through or, or apps through people, you have a smaller audience. The nice thing about Angry Birds is anybody who has ten minutes is a potential customer, right? Anybody who's ever been bored is a potential customer. So that's really good because. That's, you know, 500 million people. But if you say, well, I'm going to build a tool that is going to be used in the entertainment business, well, there's only a few thousand people that actually might use it. And so you're not going to, you have to realize that it's, it's, it's a much smaller market, you know. Um, and so a lot of people develop for medicine and stuff like that. Uh, one of my apps actually has been used in, in the uh, med- medical industry. And... Um, there's just a smaller market, but you have to, if you're in the medical community, for that example, or you're in the entertainment community, you know how to network. You know how to, you copy people. You ha- you're inside of a network, and so you can move that content around. So this is one thing that is a, a good example, and I was actually going to show this, but I, uh, the projector doesn't want to talk to my iPad, so I just have a couple slides. Um, but this is a tool that is a good example where I felt... The story behind this tool is I felt that the world that was providing a number, the, product, the products out there that were providing web dailies, I felt that the user experience wasn't that fun. And I felt that when uh, using dailies, reviewing dailies is very, very necessary. Remember we talked about uh, being on the road, being way out there. Sure, people are going to be uh, shooting out of different towns. You need to have that collaboration, right? We said creative control is speed, feedback, 
and collaboration, communication, well, you need to be able to have a system that does that. And so there were cloud-based systems out there, not a lot, but people started building a way to put your footage on the cloud and then get it wherever you want. But the user experience to me always felt like it wasn't fun. And it felt that it wasn't that collaborative. And it felt that it was all about being in the moment of just viewing pictures. Now, viewing pictures is fun, and it's cool, and it's easy, because you can just open up your iPad and view your pictures. But the problem is, that isn't collaborative necessarily. That isn't communicating things. And it may not be quickly getting information to the next link in the chain. So in terms of thinking about workflow, the next link in the chain after viewing something is usually editorial. They're usually the next person that's going to get something. So wouldn't it be great if you could actually take pictures, view them, notate them, arrange them, edit them, and then communicate all that automatically to your edit room? And especially if your edit room is not next to you. And that may be down the street, down the road, or down in another country. Like, that, that's all fine. Because once it's on the cloud, it doesn't matter if they're 100 feet away or 100 miles away. So this was sort of the idea of a very creatively driven solution. And so sometimes ideas, I didn't invent um, web dailies or digital dailies. Just like Steve Jobs didn't invent the phone. But he came up with a better way to make a phone. And so I just came up with a better way to deliver dailies to people and make it a better experience while you're doing it. But the, the, the actual purpose of a phone when you're making phone calls, Apple's version and the Razor, Motorola's Razor version, they're not that different. But all these other things make it different. And that's really how a lot of apps are done. So I think it's, uh, thank you. I think it's really important to understand that if you are developing tools, this is one great way to do it, is even find tools that are already out there that you feel aren't that spectacular, that you could maybe do better, that you could think of a better way to use it. Um, for us, the best thing about this particular tool, which we call LivePlay, is it talks to the nonlinear editing machines. So things that you do in the iPad on the cloud are automatically rebuilt or um, managed in the NLE. In fact, you can even make notes, and you can even make timelines, and you can submit them to things like Final Cut Pro or Premiere or Avid, and they will rebuild themselves. So the edit room, you don't have to do paperless. You don't write emails with time code. You don't describe things. You don't just say seem take. You just do it. You just sculpt it as you're working creatively, and you just hit send. And then the edit machine receives that information and reconstructs it. And it becomes a really great way, even down to like if you, um, in, we have uh, ways to actually make little notations based on like people's names. We borrowed, stole, borrowed, I don't know. We borrowed from like Facebook, which is a, you know, Facebook has taught us as a society that tagging is very simple. You realize if there's a photo of you and someone tags your name in it, everyone who knows you gets that photo. So one person exhibited about two seconds of effort, and now maybe 100 people can see the result of that. You realize that's how tagging works, right? Minimal effort and then big result, so like um, uh, inverted pyramid. And this is the same principle. When you tag someone's name, when you tag a location, when you tag a place, all of a sudden, that becomes searchable and findable in an edit system. So in the editing system, you could say, I want to find everything with Steven that takes place in the barn at night. And instantly, it just filters all those clips. And the iPad does the exact same thing. Show me Steven in the barn at night, and we'll show you that. And that's the type of user experience that is, is borrowing from social media, which is how we're starting to learn how to behave and interact. Um, and then it's also making sure that editors have more and more information to pull from because editors want more communication instead of less. So these are really, really good ways in order to do that. This is a picture of uh, one of the windows in Final Cut because in Final Cut, we're able to actually, this is really cool. This, if you look on the left and right, you can see I actually have um, uh, scene and take here, right? So if I look, this is like the scenes and takes. Um, there's the takes. Uh, and uh, where we go? There's the shot and take. And then there, you can also see there's like um, um, names and, and, and little types of different notes. All this information is actually edited uh, on the iPad. 
And what's really cool about this particular information is that nobody entered scene and take to get this there. There are ways to do this that are completely automatic, that are very, very clever, so that you don't have to sit there and type in scene and take. It just comes to you arranged scene and take. And those are the types of techniques that we're trying to do. When I look at a set, do you realize on a set, just take something like scene and take, do you realize that someone writes it on a whiteboard, on a slate, right? Then someone else writes it on a camera report. Then Scripty writes it on her script notes. And then the sound department writes that down. Then somehow that stuff is like faxed somewhere. And then someone else gets it in the cutting room and they're writing stuff down. And all of a sudden we just see just something like scene and take. How many times has 22 take one been written down by different people? Right? Imagine if every email you received when you hit reply or forward, you had to retype the first email plus your response. That makes no sense. Yet that's the behavior that we've gotten used to in how cinema works. Like, well, I'll just write it down again. If something's written down once in a digital world, it never needs to be written down ever again. Ever. And so that's the type of ideology where a, you know, they call them smart slates. They're not smart at all, you know. They're just a whiteboard with time code on it, which is fairly useless because it's based on 24 hours, which doesn't even make any sense. So, um, you know, like this is where you got to think out of the box. You got to figure out, well, what could be built to make this better? How can we make something better? And if we can write something down once digitally, then we can copy paste it automatically for everything else that is going to utilize it. And so that's the type of stuff that software will enable. And it's going to come from people like you. It's going to come from anybody that just sees the opportunity and sees, oh, this is actually a different way of thinking. And I've always been bothered. But for some of you, you may have written down that scene and take a thousand times, and you never realize you're just repeating yourself over and over and over. And you're like, wait a minute. Those are the types of things you got to acknowledge and say, maybe I can do this differently. And the people that are really doing it differently, these are just a few of them. These are the people that are standing out, that are doing it differently, that are pushing the boundaries, that are saying, we are going to take a stand. I've been saying, I, I've been giving presentations for quite a while, and some of them from five, six, seven years ago, I have Netflix uh, listed. I got presentations from 2007 that say, watch out, Netflix is going to take over. And in 2007, people are like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, all the signs were there that Netflix was totally going to do some incredible disruption. They are a disruptive innovator, and they are making waves, and now they're moving into content, and they're also you know, winning awards for their content and, and, and gaining massive viewership. These are the type of people that are innovating, um, and the people that innovate are the directions, and that's where the technology is going to be fueled. It's going to be driven. Consumers are behind these groups. Again, these aren't all of them, but these are just a few of them. I don't know if you know that the Xbox One and the PS4 are both 4K media players. They're 4K media servers. Even though there's no 4K gaming yet, those boxes are 4K systems. Most gaming consoles are built for an 8 to 10 year lifespan. If you do the math and you look back, you'll see every gaming console that came out lasted at least 8 years. Um, and so... Uh, Sony and uh, Microsoft both says, well, we know that eight years from now definitely have 4K. So you have to put 4K in your machine today. So these two machines are 4K media servers that people don't even have 4K content running on them. But you will. It's already there. And the roadmap's all the way there. And that's the type of ideology you want to get behind companies that are thinking that way so that we can do that. Um, the iTunes store used to be in Santa Monica, California. That's where all the media was originally stored. And then as the need for more bandwidth and, and growth came, they moved it to a bigger building and prepared before they ever released video because the iTunes store originally was uh, just sound. And then they released video, and they had to move it and grow it and grow it and grow it, and they prepared all that ahead of time. And I predict that you'll see that happening again with HEVC or H265. You're going to see a whole bunch of groups right now starting to position because they know that HEVC is going to drop very soon and it's going to change what's possible in terms of the internet and change what's possible going forward. So these are the type, these are just a few of the leaders that you should be watching them. Buy stock if you can. These are pretty safe bets um, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, and these are people that are motivated to invoke change. And when you watch other groups starting to struggle for power, I was, in, I was in a cab this morning, 
And I didn't tell him how I felt. I just asked him because I ask every time. I, I live in New York and L.A. And um, I asked, what do you think of Uber? I love asking cabbies what they think of Uber. And, you know, you probably know the answer. They're, they're wrong. They're unfair. They're illegal. There's all these reasons where you shouldn't have that. But here is a company in a market where you wouldn't think that you could rebuild and, and, and just totally revitalize moving people around metropolitan areas. It doesn't seem like technology could actually improve that. How could you make a better taxi cab with a computer? Uber, right? They made a better taxi cab using a computer. And it just shows that there is not one market that is not going to be touched by this type of stuff. How would no one would have thought when the first Netflix DVDs were mailed, delivered to you by your mail carrier, no one would have thought this is going to be a company that's going to win the Emmy for best dramatic series, and they're not going to distribute it over television. How is that possible? But those are the ideas that are there, and these are the people that are innovating it along those points. And so you kind of have to think about who's got vested interests in legacy technologies and legacy ideologies and legacy groups, and who's got interests in future groups. Schools are one of these groups. I know you guys have a great school in town here. And one of the things, and I, I don't know a ton about that school. I did speak at it a few years ago. But um, schools are a big group where you have often a huge, I went to a school uh, which was really, really turbulent when it came to innovation because you had legacy invested staff and faculty. And then you had a progressive driven student body. Those are like two magnets that won't that do this, right? They don't get along. And so who? nobody wins in that situation. When I was in college, I basically left just feeling awful because nobody wins if you have a progressive-driven consumer group and a legacy-driven um, uh, mastered group, you know, a uh, powerful group, uh, in, investor group. And, and that's where you need to sort of learn how to either get along or change or, or, or move forward or identify what potentials there are to improve the process. And so that's a really, really important place. And I, and I look to those companies every day to do that. Um, so here's a couple golden nuggets. I'll, I'll end with this. Um, uh, basically, if you like the idea of case studies, these are some resources that will show you case studies on some of this stuff, which can be very valuable. Um, I do a huge education program, which is online, called Outpost University or Outpost U. And I think there's something like 15 hours of content up there. So you can listen to me yak forever if that was something you felt like doing. Um, there is a lot of stuff on our blog, which we call Views from the Lighthouse. This blog is one of the most underrated blogs um, in the industry because we're very, very strategic about how this blog works. And if you look closely at it, what we do, remember I, you know, I showed you some of these graphs and some of these predictions and stuff like that. All that stuff comes from published information, but just not everybody knows how to assemble it together to form a conclusion. A lot of the components that go into calculating and predicting things, we just post on Views from the Lighthouse. But it's very, very subliminal. Sometimes we'll write a little sentence that says something significant, but then you have to read the article and you've got to hunt I don't always give every answer away, and I haven't formed every answer yet because sometimes I'm just gathering the articles and saying, this is important. I don't know where it fits yet. It's just important, so we're going to save it. The database on that um, Views from the Lighthouse, you couldn't click on any month or any week and not find something poignant. There is something important in every single article that we post that plays a role in the bigger picture. And again, we don't always know what that role will be. We just can sometimes find them. So that's significant. And then um, we do offer something we call light grade, which uh, for indies and students, we have uh, finishing services that is also kind of part of working with the community because we want to elevate the community. Um, I got my start in independent cinema and uh, loved it. I, I don't know how many indie films I did, but I loved them all. And it sort of helped elevate. And some of my early independent film filmmaking friends, now they've sort of elevated, and together we're doing much bigger pictures. So we know that it's important to include um, people that are moving up in the food chain in the process. And so we try to make sure that that's possible as well for them. Um, so uh, basically, that's kind of what I have for today. That's today's state of D-Cinema. Um, and so I'll uh, take some questions if you guys have any.
Yeah. Yeah. Speakers all over the place and so on. It seems to me that if you really want that immersive experience, uh, you know, you're not going to get it out of an iPad or a or an iPhone. So, what's going to happen in personal hearing things like we have on retina screens that's going to enhance not just you know not just 5D but 128D, I guess. That's a great question, actually. Really fantastic question. What uh, you're talking about is actually Dolby Atmos sound, which is a uh, 13 to 26 point uh, surround sound system. Very, very powerful, very, very immersive, very, very cool. Um, and, you know, Walter Murch, uh, I believe it was Walter Murch, said, The eye sees what the ear hears. And so the idea that sound uh, playing the role that it does play, it almost tells us what to see, which is why you guys realize a good sound mix is actually better than a good color correction. Not everybody realizes that, but, you know, you can look at garbage all day long, and if it sounds bad, you won't watch it. But if it sounds good, you can tolerate it, and the brain sort of makes it all work. So um, you're right about the immersive experience, and you're not going to have that on the tablet. And this is very, very sticky, but the truth is, you have a tug of war going on. And one is the impressive delivery through Atmos sound, uh, laser projection, um, you know, rumbling seats, 3D, all those things. You have that emotional impact, tugging war with convenience. And that's really the tug of war. And everyone that fights on the big picture scenario has a huge list of things that are all very heavy, both anecdotally and physically, to say this is better. But when it comes down to sometimes you just don't, you have a, you feel like you have just, you have a headache or you have a bug in your stomach or, you know, that, that meatloaf in the fridge, you know, smells pretty good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cook it. You go, you know, I'm not gonna go to the movies tonight out of convenience. And that tug of war, that is so strong, that little thing in our mind that we all have that says, eh, I don't want to get in the car. Eh, it's a little cold. Eh, it's kind of rainy. You know, that's the type of thing. And that is more powerful than Atmos sound and THX and 3D and 4. It's all those things com combined together. That little thing in our head that just says, I just don't want to do it. And that is actually going to grow and not shrink. It absolutely will grow and not shrink. And because the tablets will get more and more superior, headphones getting more and more superior, or even home entertainment sound, which is wireless now and very, very easy to set. You don't have to run cables like people did for, you know, and the speakers are very small. All of a sudden, that home is competing. And remember, you're not going to see a lot of 4K in the movie theater, but you can, you can get, already get 4K in the home. And, you know, that there's new, like, Samsung curved HDTV and things like that are, are pretty cool, so... Good question. You, sir, in the back. Yeah. On the distribution side, you know, uh, what's your thoughts on the delay of the implementation of IPv6 in the United States? Oh. Um, well, so your, your question is basically about we have, we have a whole bunch of potential distribution options that are out there. And there's some are being delayed and some are being pushed through. Um, and, um, you know, the answer to that is, I, I actually don't, I haven't really formed a conclusion on that yet because um, I really believe that terrestrial distribution through, uh, uh, not through satellites and not through broadcast and just through Internet is actually still not mature. So I have to reserve the end of that till H.265 comes out, but I actually I don't have a, a, a direct feeling on that yet. Go, but would you follow up? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I can tell you that um, the, the biggest problem, the funny thing that a lot of people don't know, I'll get you guys, the funniest thing people don't know is that uh, maybe you do know, America has some of the worst internet in the world, right? Okay, you guys do that. Great. All right. So you go to Europe, you go to Asia, 
you have far superior internet. Now, America also has some of the oldest internet. So there's a reason sometimes our internet is bad because we laid a lot of cable very early on. And if you start doing stuff sooner, you get, you get better stuff. However, it's the corporate interest. And because America is such a big nation, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not trying to be too ethnocentric here, but everything we do concerns 300 million people. And I think a lot of times, if you only have 30 million people, it's easier to make certain decisions and stuff like that, right? And so we're obviously broken up into states, but so are other countries. And so what we have to do is make sure, and I don't know exactly whose job this is, because the government isn't that involved in the Internet, and I guarantee they that will be. Uh, we need to make sure that the interests of the people that actually provide Internet service are not purposefully delayed so that they can make more money over time, which is kind of how they're doing it right now. You also know cell phones in other countries are on large per minute cheaper and coverage is often a lot better. So we do have, there's some cheating going on. You know, it's, it's capitalism at its best, I guess you could say. Yes, sir. Could you give us your thoughts on REC 2020 versus, say, like ACES? Because oh. uh, you mentioned the thing about uh, editing camera original media which obviously that's one of those places where convenience starts to outweigh the, the kind of uh, perfectionism of wanting to go with something like ACES. Really great question. So the question was basically there, Rec 2020 versus something like ACES. So here's the truth. Um, uh, ACES, which is a really, really big subject, and I, I didn't bring it up, but uh, it'll, it'll come up. It's, it's, it's a big issue. Um, basically, with ACES, you have an academy driven academy motion pictures arts and sciences the academy driven version of how they think things should be done and then uh, rec 2020 which is more of a simpty version which is sort of more um, open format and the real difference between them though is the academy's version is more about how you capture it how you finish it and how you um archive it that's what aces is trying to do it's trying to create a roadmap so you can capture display and archive and follow and put it in a nice box. Rec 2020 is only concerned about what does the actual exhibition device look like. And so they're, all, they're, they're saying, look, you, how you want to archive it and how you want to capture it, that's your problem, that's your choice. And so that actually then, so that's the difference between those two. And that actually suggests, well, which is one of these ethically better than the other? And actually has an ethics question, I think, to it because if the idea of an institution controlling how certain things look, is that always in your best interest or sometimes that's not in your best interest? Because if, if the idea is we can make a package that works perfectly in all these different cameras, all very similar and all very, you know, perfect. Well, what if you don't want it perfect? You know, what if people um, I did a movie with Rob Zombie uh, a couple years ago. Um, which was his, most of the time he shoots on 16 and he likes to push super deep grain. And on this particular f movie, um, he basically said, well, we're, we're, they wanted to shoot digital. So we just pushed the digital totally over the mountain. Like we just went crazy with it. It doesn't look digital at all, but sort of we broke every rule because the creative intent won. Right. And so there's something to be said about having boundaries, but then breaking them because an artist says, I'm not going to paint with a brush. I'm going to paint with this bucket. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. So those are the types of things that it really comes down to. So Rec 2020 makes it very simple for just to make sure it's displayed correctly so that if you decide to paint with a bucket instead of a brush, people can still come and see it. Right. And it's that's the way it's supposed to look. Aces is saying, Here's the bucket, here's the brush, the perfect bucket, the perfect brush, the perfect canvas, right? And so there's really good things for both of those, but there's also arguments that are, you know, arguable. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say that the ACES would help you get it to market with your intent intact? I wouldn't say ACES improves or unimproves your chances to make it look correct. You can do it with or without ACES. Yep. Yes, sir. How do you um, integrate into your, your theories um, how government impacts with net neutrality um, this process? Does it derail it? Does it sort of delay it? Does it skew it? Can you give me just one more specific one, like what sector you're kind of talking about? Well, you said the, you know, the c consumer, the end user is obviously the most important. 
and a lot of this has to do with the internet access and I'm sure speeds, and so therefore, if your end user is not getting you know, the quality of product that you're trying to put out because of net neutrality, how does that um, change the evolution of all this? That's a really great question, and I don't want to misunderstand it, and I don't want to go too deep into it, but that's a, that's a fan all your questions today have been stellar. Um, so I would say the, uh, the issue is behavioral change can be driven by, by the consumer and not by the government. And I think in this case, that's why it's actually going to work. For example, in the past, people didn't buy TVs, but maybe every 10, and, and, and for some of us, we probably had TVs last for 20 years, right? Like TVs last 10, 20 years, okay? And that is a normal behavioral thing that people say, oh, every 10 years you get a new TV. But how often do you buy a computer? Totally different schedule, right? Much faster. Would you say conservatively three years? Maybe it's two, as little as two years is not out of the question, right? How often do you get a phone? Even shorter, right? So the behavioral changes of how something like a television versus a computer versus a phone, the people that are controlling the interests of developing those technologies know that, and they're training you this is the schedule, and this is the pricing model, and this is the investment, and this is what you get when you move on these rhythms. And the TV market is trying to get on a faster rhythm right now. They're trying to get their motor to move faster. And so net neutrality is somewhat connected with this, but you, you mentioned earlier in the government, and I just believe it's the manufacturers that are saying, look, there's all these reasons why this won't work. How can we actually train people and make them satisfied. They're not tricking us. Like, we like getting a new phone every year or two, right? Like, it's fun. And they're developing fast enough that it's almost always worth it. So those are the types of things. And they know that video and distribution and exhibition and 4K and things like that are part of getting people onto that. Um, so I know that's not exactly in the same thing, but hopefully I hit something on the head there. So, all right, yeah. So I, it's a little bit of a semantic argument, but this whole idea of cloud versus file, I mean, at some point, actually, out there on the cloud, there's some virtualized server that's somewhere at some data center that's being maintained, and it's just how you talk to it. And at some point, it is actually still a bunch of files, whether it's little tiny ones because they're metadata, or your whole, um, you know, the whole The real image, file. Yep. Uh, of what you have, I mean, it's. I mean, you've had the the graph of file versus cloud, and I, I would. What are your comments on whether that's really a semantic argument about where the files are, as opposed to what the thing is? Do you know what I great, mean? Great, great question. So, uh, in terms of working with camera footage today, everybody's camera footage is local. There is no way, there, there are a couple ways and they're all these progressive ways, right? But basically people today, when you're working on motion picture entertainment content, it's local. So it is of course a file, it will always be a file of some kind, but it will be local. As the whole point is just to make them all remote. So today, none of YouTube is local, right? None of it's local. You don't have YouTube on your computer, you don't install a YouTube app, you don't download YouTube files when you wanna watch them, they're always available because the file being in the cloud, obviously it has to exist somewhere on the ground, but we use it as a metaphor to describe it's all encompassing. So the transition is going to be from getting people that have local footage to use remote footage all the time. And that is going to be a, a few steps. But were you gonna say, does that make sense? I mean. Yeah, I mean, my, my point was just like, you know, people think of cloud as this kind of magic thing. And it's yeah. like, I used to work for an IT company we sell cl that sells cloud services. And at the bottom, at the end of the day, anything that you have on the cloud is basically, it's still a bunch, a file or a collection of files sitting out on a virtualized server on real hardware in a data center yeah. somewhere. Yeah, that that's right. Kind You're of right. Yeah, that's totally right. We're in agreement on that. It does exist. And a cloud is not quite magic. You're also right. I, people do think it's magic, but it's not. Yeah.
Um, first of all, great presentation, Michael. It was Thanks. wonderful. Um, secondly, as sort of an extension to what we've been talking about here, um, I see a lot of parallelism between this industry and the medical industry and some other things that we focus on with in high performance computing. Um, what ends up happening always is people forget about security. And mm -hmm. I'm really curious to see from an industry perspective what kinds of thought goes around that because you can have the best movie in the world, the best content, and all of a sudden you've got some sort of malware or piece of thing that gets attached to your, your file and it's game over. You're absolutely right. Great question, great comment about security. Let me post something about security that I think a lot of people forget to look at. If you are to do a massive research study on uh, uh, piracy, you will find that the overwhelming majority, like, like I, can't, I don't want to make up a percent, but the overwhelming majority of piracy happens when a project is finished and boxed together. Do we all agree with that? That's when piracy really gets interesting, right? Because there's a product, okay? The next level of piracy, when something happens, so we have to separate these categories. There's a finished product piracy and there's an unfinished product piracy. Now the unfinished product piracy is far smaller because it's less interesting, because it's less valuable, right? So if you're gonna steal a work of art, if it's only half painted, what's the point, right? Like it's really hard to sell that half paint, but when it's finished, Okay, now there's some value to it. So, we've got these two categories of piracy, and that starts to tell a story. Hopefully you can kind of see where I'm going. That, that's part of this story. But then we have another component to this. Most of the unfinished piracy is through inside jobs. These are not people that are packet sniffing over on a rooftop that are trying to intercept information that they might randomly come across, right? These are people who work and when are employed who steal or make a very, very bad decision or a huge accident, something like that. It's usually an inside job. So when we get down to security, the value, the opportunity, uh, and the availability of actually stealing content that is in a construction form is almost, it's, it's almost self-secure because uh, I worked on uh, Spider-Man, The Amazing Spider-Man, and I remember being downtown, and everything's about security with that movie. And I remember being downtown, and there are a thousand people up in their apartments shooting photos of Spider-Man who's hanging from a cable, and there's like green mats all over the place. What is the value of Spider-Man footage if he's hanging from a cable, he's not talking because there's no sound, there's no music, and there's the person he's shooting isn't standing there, right? If you were to look at all the dailies of Avatar, it's just a bunch of people in leotards with golf balls all over them. There's no value. There's no value to that. So just the interest, like I, I got, I got all the, I stole all the dailies for Avatar. I'm going to put them on the line. No one would watch them. It doesn't make any sense, you know? It's like, I want to see them on the dragons with the music, you know? That's what a movie is. So there is this sort of two halves of piracy and, and security, but we have to do and follow security protocols so that people that do have an interest in stealing something can't, right? So um, when it comes down to the ultimate piracy, uh, you need to have encryption. You know, encryption is big, um, and you need to have there's systems out there because I think as a, as a, as a society we're learning and, and all of us are no different. A teacher is no different than a studio executive. We all tend to have like one or two or three passwords, maybe one. And we use it everywhere on everything. And we're all learning to do that. And the problem is that is where a security breach comes into play because you're easy to penetrate because you use the same password everywhere. So what systems, there's a group out there that makes a tool called One Login. And one login basically takes all your logins for all your things and it sort of generates passwords that even you can't see and know. And it, it helps secure things through um, making a single login database that you log into like each morning. And you're like, okay, these is, you're going to have access to all these things today based on this. And then each day you have to redo it basically. And so it's keeping all your stuff secure. So that's a new technique that is coming into it. Um, also, you can now encrypt 
video files in their transmission. So like iPads didn't used to make that easy, but now you can actually encrypt files. So you can encrypt it on the way up from the to the cloud. You can encrypt it on the way down from the cloud. So that's important. That's 256-bit hex, uh, hex encryption. There's HTTPS streaming, right? Secured streaming. There's hidden SSID networks so that you don't make your... It's a good idea for your internet base station to not be visible because that is a huge deterrent. I mean, we realize that we all have locks on the doors and you lock your door at night generally. Is a lock really going to stop someone that wants to get in your house and harm you? No. But guess what? It keeps about 99.99% .99 of people away. Just a lock. And that's a, a hidden web network. It will keep so many people away just because it's a deterrent. And most people are in that deterrent. If someone really wants to steal a movie, they're going to get it because they're going to put in enough effort to get employed and work their way up the show and get hired. And if that's their desire, they could, they could steal it, you know? So I don't want to go into too much into that, but that, that was actually a really great comment, though. How about two more? Brad, do we have enough for two more? OK, two more. I saw a couple hands earlier. Yes, sir. So going back a ways to your discussions, we were talking about the theater versus the uh, iPad. What about home theater? I mean, I decided I wanted to have a projector. I went out, spent 400 bucks on a refurb, and I got a home theater. It's not fancy or anything like that, but it's really easy to get to you. Used yeah. to 110 inches. Yeah. Great, great comment about home theater. So here's where home theater is going to go, I think. So right now we have televisions, and we have computers, and we have gaming consoles, okay? And then we have projectors and theaters and stuff like that. The problem is not any company has actually fused these into one product, and that's what's wrong with home theaters. If you look at the home theater, think about the 1990s when 5.1 had just kind of started coming out, and people started getting the idea of the big screen TV and projection TVs in the, in the mid to late 90s. There were so many components. Remember, like receivers and the media center and the speakers and the, the VHS and the DVD and all this stuff. Like, it got really out of control. And it was sort of a bigger is better, more is more kind of world, right? But they were all independent components that were all sort of meant to connect together. That's how people did it. What you don't have today and what you're going to have, and I believe Apple is going to make this. I think Google's making one too. And I hope Microsoft does. Um, but I don't know if they will. Um, but I believe Google and Apple are going to kind of fight at this. And Apple's probably ahead of Google right now. I don't know this for a fact, but this is my... Uh, my uh, guess. I believe Apple right now is working and they've been building the hybrid or the fusion between a television and a computer and a media center. And what you're visualizing right now is like a TV computer, you know, media center. It doesn't look like that because just like the iPod didn't look like a Walkman, right? Like it's, it's different enough that it works completely differently. The behavior is completely different. And so what we need to see is the fusion of the computer and the television into the same device. Apple is not going to let Samsung Sharp and Magnavox and Sony and Panasonic make TVs forever because Apple's got retina display patents, and so they have really good display technology. Sometimes you could argue it's superior than some of the other panel technologies. So they're going to just scale that up, I believe, and then they've got... Um, everybody has, oh, so many people have eye devices of some component, and people have like Apple TVs, and they've got iPods, and they have computers at home, and Apple can fuse all those into one system, create a media center. I believe Apple is also going to compete with Sony and Microsoft on the gaming market, because the gaming market, they distribute more games than anybody, and uh, I think they're just going to say, well, we're also a gaming console, and everybody just uses a phone or a, a, an iPod, iPad as a remote control for that. And it's all just going to be one thing. So the home entertainment world is about to have a huge revolution um, connected to that, which is actually the most interesting component of the whole story, is when the Apple television or Microsoft or Google television comes out, it will start a clock like a fuse, and the fuse will take three years to burn down. And what it will do is it will be three years before the television broadcast world 
crumbles. Because once the internet is delivered that well, once you literally have, you've seen those lines of people that line up for these phones and these tablets and stuff like that. Once people can line up and 30 million people buy the same television, which has never happened in history ever before, but that's predictable. Once that happens, everyone's going to start doing the same thing with this particular process. And broadcast is going to not be able to sell advertising spaces efficiently. And if broadcast, remember, remember TV, people forget, TV's free. Does everybody know that? TV's free. You don't pay for it. Um, you might pay someone to bring it to your home, but you don't actually pay for television. Uh, so advertisers pay for television. And if advertisers can't sell because the Internet is taking over through devices like this, uh, then broadcast inevitably will fail. So you're going to see the home entertainment world is actually going to destroy broadcasters. It'll, it'll take. It'll only take about three years. It'll happen really quick, I think. But I don't know when the first year is. It might be 2016 or 2017. But when these devices come out, it probably will be before the end of the decade before people can. They won't. They won't watch television because there'll be no broadcasters to pay. No one will buy. S.C. Johnson Wax won't buy ads to actually, you know, look at stuff. So it'd be kind of interesting. It's kind of scary, but pretty cool. Yeah. Last one. Great stuff. Thank you very much. Um, so coming back to your pixel quality formula, uh, I agree wholeheartedly with everything you said, basically. And I'm just as a techie myself, curious what you think about how frame rate mixes into those three oh, things. OK, that's a good one to end on. So for frame rate, the big question with frame rate is how do we, if we have, if we have high dynamic range, we have great color, and we have more pixels, what about frame rate? And the answer is this. As you increase dynamic range, think of a black pixel and a white pixel bordering each other. If the difference in brightness today between black and white is the way it is, uh, think about if you looked at a picture that was black and white and you were driving by buildings and the, the images were black and white and you were driving horizontally by buildings, you know the buildings would appear to flicker. Can you visualize that? Like if you see black and light lines and you're driving past it, they're going to appear to flicker. The flicker is not any more real or unreal if the camera isn't moving and it's a color picture. The same amount of flicker is happening. But the way our brain perceives the black and white contrast produces a little bit more pronounced flicker. Are you with me? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, take that black and white pixel and make them 600 times further apart in terms of brightness. How flicker is that going to look, right? Because the Dolby Vision TV that they have right now is like a few hundred times further apart. The white and black pixel that you see today are going to be hundreds of times more dynamic, which is incredible. I mean, it's, the image is just like blows your mind. It's so fantastic. But that means the contrast ratio is so great, flickering is going to be increased. So how do you reduce flickering? You add more frames per second. So if people want more dynamic range and they want to push that, by adding in more frames into that, it actually will produce less perceptible flicker. So if you looked at um, one of uh, Peter Jackson's recent Hobbit movies, because they have higher frames, they look strange, but you notice they don't flicker. You can actually see more detail even when they're panning and whip panning and there's all sorts of action. You actually see more detail in stoned motion blur. And that actually could be really good. So it's actually tied together to this. Uh, and that's a very good observation that, uh, that high frame rate plays a role in it. But if people want high frame rate just for the point of you know, high frame rate, that doesn't work. If people want 4K for the point of 4K, it doesn't work. Or color. And that's why you've got to look at the interest when certain people say, we are anti-4K, but we're big on color. I'll bet you make monitors that aren't 4K monitors. You might say that if you only had 1080 panels, right? And if you're really into 4K and you say it's the best thing in the world, I bet you're a camera manufacturer because you can make that, but you don't have to worry about distributing it over the internet, right? So you got to look at when people are pro or anti something, what the heck is their, what are they, what do, who do they work for, right? Where, where do they live? What's their point? What's their job? And that sort of reveals that. But what I like to do is take all that into consideration, add it together and be like, hey, this is a formula for something. I personally think that creatively, high frame rate is a little, is the least immersive. I think it's the one that doesn't actually improve the picture 
too much. Maybe a little bit, but not as much as like 4K or high dynamic range. Those would prove it a lot. But they're all tied together. And so there's going to have to be a compromise. If you want more dynamic range, you're going to need more frames. You know? So there's so many great things about that. So, all right. That was a really great session this morning. I thank you guys all for having me in. Appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, my, my email's there. You can always email me, ask me questions. Happy to help. Cool.